Can people really change or are they stuck being the same exact way their entire life? What is the ideal life? Is it sitting on a beach in Barbados? Is it working in a cubicle doing your nine to five? Or is it laying in bed all day long? Those are some of the questions introduced in Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov, which I believe is an absolute masterpiece. And I think it kind of gets forgotten, or I don't want to say forgotten, but a little bit ignored within the milieu of 19th century Russian literature, primarily because you have greats like Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Tolstoy, Lermontov, so many of these great writers that I think a, a, an author like Gontrov and a book like Oblobov kind of gets forgotten. So I want to talk about why I love this book, why it's a five-star read, why I think you should read it, and specifically how a lot of the ideas contained within this novel relate to society today, how things are still quite timeless. So let's dig on in. Now, before we get to the book itself, you guys know I like to discuss a little bit about the author and provide a backdrop to the work itself. So when it comes to Ivan Goncharov, 19th century Russian novelist, like I mentioned, and he was very plugged into the community. He was friends with Turgenev and Chekhov and Dostoevsky. And yet with that, he kind of gets forgotten for a few reasons. One primarily being this was really his only prominent work that is still looked at today, that still remains in print and gets appreciated. And he kind of turned sour later in his life. He was suing his friend Turgenev because he was claiming that he was plagiarizing his work. And so everything kind of turned sour later in life for Goncharov. He burned a lot of bridges, basically. But even with that, Dostoevsky still had extremely high praise for him. Uh, Anton Chekhov had a great praise as well, said he was 10 heads ahead of him. And uh, you understand why when you read a work like this. Now, a little bit about Oblomov itself, published in 1859, and it centers around this reoccurring theme of the superfluous man within Russia. And what is the superfluous man? We see this in A Hero of Our Time with Lermontov and some other stories as well. And the superfluous man is, it's an individual who's at odds with society. He looks around and he finds himself shaped and, and influenced by his environment, by his country, by culture, yet he's at odds with it. He's kind of like a puzzle piece found in the wrong box. He just doesn't fit in. He looks around and sees that they're chasing these certain ways of life. They're living with these certain ideologies and the individual just feels isolated, alienated, and just can't seem to, to fit in or find his place. In fact, the term in Russian is Lishni Chilovik, which just means the extra person or the surplus person, the superfluous man. And you can kind of understand this. He's, he's an intelligent, kind of individualistic type of man who just finds himself on the outskirts and isolated and unable to fulfill himself in, in society, unable to kind of realize these ideals that he has. And so he remains quite indecisive. And that's exactly what we see with Oblomov in this story. And I really think it introduces some ideas of you know, what is right for the individual versus society? Is there kind of a ubiquitous right way to live or right way to exist? And that might be a perfect transition into the book itself. Now, when it comes to the plot, I'll briefly describe it and then I want to dig into and spend most of the time in this video on those core themes. And by doing that, we'll kind of explore the plot deeper itself. But the plot follows this man, Ilya Ilyich Oblomov. He is a soft bodied, lazy, milk toast man. He's indecisive, he wants to avoid any form of exertion. He literally spends the first 50 to 70 pages in bed just having visitors come in and he's berating his uh, servant and just being a lazy bones essentially. And uh, again, he, he's, his view, and this is how he's raised, his view of the ideal life is one spent in idleness. It's the, it's the one with the least stress, the least concerns. Just let me, let me avoid any anxiety, or any discomfort. That's the ideal life. It's a life of peace. And on the surface, you can kind of imagine that. And maybe a many of you relate to that. You're like, hey, I'd rather sit in these warm, oh so comfortable, cozy bed sheets all day. I don't want to get up and face the cold, harsh reality of the world and the stresses and the, 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 the fears that I have, the anxiety for what I have to face out there, the potential chaos that could arise. Uh, I'd rather just stay in my bed. It's cozy, it's comfortable, it's soft. And, and that's a more happy life. Isn't that happiness? Isn't happiness, you know, again, peace and serenity and tranquility? That's the Oblomov type of mindset, Oblomovism, basically. Avoiding, you know, action and risk and 
um, any, again, exertion, any work, any labor. And uh, this is how he's living, basically, until his, his childhood friend, Andre Stolls, who has this Germanic upbringing of duties and expectations and rules and standards, he's a very industrious type of individual, comes up, he's like, dude, get the hell out of bed, what are you doing? We, we got a life to live, basically. And, uh, you know, Oblomov looks at him, he's like, hey, all these friends, all these people in society, perhaps Stolls included, are chasing these kind of frivolous matters, and to what end? You're chasing this career, you're chasing after these girls, these thrills, you're busy jump, you know, going all over the place in the in the town. For what? What are you chasing? And he has this quote, which we'll get to later, about how, you know, these people are just as dead and living meaningless lives as a blow-off. Like, why are they, why is the way that they're living any better when they're, you know, aimlessly wandering around as well? And uh, this is, leads leads to this argument and this rift between them where Stoll's essentially is like, hey, Life is about work. Life is about producing something. Life is about chasing meaning, passion, all of this. Uh, and, and it finally gets and, and rouses Oblomov up out of bed and uh, finally gets him going, basically. And this is a theme we see over and over throughout the work. Um, but it leads him to falling in love with this woman named Olga. And they have uh, frequent trysts and, their, and, and engagements together where they're kind of like flirting back and forth. It's It's kind of like their way of going on dates basically in a formal setting and they have so many ups and downs and roller coasters primarily because Olga and, and Stoles throughout the novel are two characters that are trying to rip Oblomov away from his natural state. They're trying to rip him out of Oblomovism, rip him out of this lazy state, this indolence, this obstinate type of behavior that he has where he just refuses or isn't able to to you know, have the motivation, have the will, the ambition to, to make something, to make change in his life, to uh, pursue anything with, with fervor and with passion. He's just unable to. And, and at times he does, right? He falls in love with Olga. He's like, oh, we're going to get married. We're going to do this, do that. Or when he's with Stoles, yeah, we're going to, you know, travel back to Oblomovka, his estate, and we're going to, you know, build this and I'm going to create this ideal life. But he finds himself t utterly unable to. He just... It, it's not just a lack of emotion, but it's just he his he can't he can't will himself to. He just can't pull it out of himself. And only when he's being dragged through with you know hand holding and uh, you know <laughs> aggressive berating by his his friend is he able to kind of uh, get something out of this. You know, have the goal to really go for it in life. And so basically, the story just follows this indecisive, indolent fool who's just over and over trying to change his ways, trying to you know break this pattern, but he, he consistently just keeps slipping down the slide and falling back to where he started, basically. And on the surface level, this novel seems a little long-winded, about 550 pages, a little long-winded for what happens simply on the page. For what happens simply on the page, what happens on the surface level is you have this lazy yet affable and, and likable character who's just a fool who keeps, you know, again, rescinding in, in his ways and falling back to old patterns and behaviors. And, um, and at times it's frustrating. But there's a lot more going on there. It really introduces and thrusts you and forces you to really think these things through in your own life. It really... Uh, is a quite provocative work because it makes you think, what is the ideal life? What is this balance between work and pleasure and idleness and leisure? And you know, what does love and marriage look like? What does a long lasting love look like? Is, you know, is love supposed to be completely irrational or where is this happiness originating from? How do I sustain it? Meaning, passion. You have so many of these things layered and intertwining within this novel through these very realistic and, and relatable characters that again are quite timeless in the way that we see them show up in society today. Uh, that I loved this work. I really fell in love with it. I enjoyed it. I was telling my, my close friend about it. I was explaining things to my wife um, every other morning about it. And uh, I feel like I, I sped through it pretty quick. Um, and it, it does feel like a work I could reread and and I would just highly recommend it. I think it's, it's not on a level of a Dostoevsky, and I can't speak to Tolstoy yet because I'm in the process of reading his big novels, but it's not on that level. It's not that sprawling, expansive, or grandiose, but 
man, is it enjoyable. I feel like it's it's funny at times. It's again, incredibly uh, intriguing and thought provoking. It's endearing. It warms your heart with some of the uh, the, the scenes of, of Olga and Oblomov and the love they share. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I can't re recommend it that much more than that. But now let's dig into the actual themes. Let's dig into the nitty gritty. And um, I'm interested to see again, what, what your thoughts are as well in the comments as it pertains to some of these ideas um, and how they relate to, again, reoccurring issues within a culture. All right, so let's talk about fate and let's talk about man's nature. Now, how those tie together is, again, the superfluous man finds himself kind of nailed down by fate. And this is something very much pushed forward by Lermontov and a hero of our time where Petrin is very much contemplating is life predetermined or are the actions that we that we make either turning left or turning right are they predetermined is there anything we can really do or is man you know born for greatness or born for weakness you know is he going to be one way or the other from birth and there's really no point in stressing it too much you know is everyone supposed to be a leader or only the napoleons of the world essentially and this is something explored by Oblomov specifically because he finds himself utterly unable to change just as much as you try and try and try and years go by he keeps falling back into the same pattern and this also introduces the idea of nature versus nurture right like is it nature is it fate are you born with this psychological condition these these predispositions these proclivities to act and 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 perform a certain way in the world or is it a lot of nurture? And if it's nurtured, can we can we correct it? Can we change that? You know, could we prevent that in the next generation? And this is kind of introduced with Oblomov being raised by his family on Oblomovka, which is their estate. And this is kind of like the land of milk and honey, or at least they, they want it to be, where the servants, the family, they're living, again, in the most idle way. In their view, if every day could be the exact same peaceful, idle day, that is a dream. They literally quote, I don't have the exact quote, I think tabbed out, but basically they're like, oh, if every day could be the same as the last, what a perfect day. And I think most of you, myself included, would be like, man, I mean, maybe, maybe, but that sounds pretty miserable if every day is so predictable and stayed and uh, plain and just insipid and colorless in that way where it's just so uh, mundane and monotonous yet for the Oblomovs that's that's life the ideal life for them is to be born to marry and to die with the least amount of exertion and uh, we see uh, this is what Stoll says when he grows up as a, as a childhood friend of Oblomov and visits he calls Oblomov a perpetual holiday where every day they're just uh, again avoiding any discomfort you know if they have to spend money oh it's such a pain like oh yeah you know, i have to spend rubles on this and i have to repair this gate at the house and they just push things off and you so you see the pushing of things off you see the avoiding of any kind of fear of any stress of any um any any immediacy they just want to defer defer you know put it off on someone else and that does a few things, but to bring in a quote here on page 143 of the Signet Classic Edition, quote, at Oblomovka, the souls of the inhabitants were drowned in their soft bodies. They were just, again, not, not quite living in indulgence, but living in passivity, you know, like just, again, just living in this passive state. And, uh, and you really see that as Oblomov grows up, how that shaped how he lives and what he believes to be the ideal life. Now, this leads me to the interjection of Olga and Stolz in his life. So as I mentioned earlier, Stolz wakes him up from his bed and he's like, what are you doing, man? Like when we were kids, you had dreams of exploring the world, of doing these different things. You studied your books and now you, you know, to finish his schooling, he would just skate by, he would do the bare minimum. And now in his life, he's just laying in bed. He's just collecting his, 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 uh, basically he's like a stipend or his income from his estate as a nobleman, just laying around doing nothing. And this is in, in a way, uh, satirizing or kind of poking fun at the nobility of the time within Russia and with, in some Western society too, in, in Europe, where if you were rich, you, you really inherited wealth and inherited titles and, I think that's kind of different. I heard it on a podcast recently when they were discussing kind of Shakespeare times, but I think it's true where we do look at rich people sometimes and, and depending on the circumstances, they do inherit wealth and they are lazy and they are privileged. But 
a lot of rich people, especially if they are self-made millionaires or actors or whatever it is, they had to work for it and they still work for it. Like, you know, they might be getting paid millions to do a movie, but they do have to do the movie versus, and these days you literally could inherit certain statuses or jobs um, and positions in society and just collect wealth and lay on your ass pretty much. You really could just do that. And that's what Oblomov's kind of doing. And uh, anyway, Stoles rouses him up. He finally gets him to to kind of awaken his soul in a way. He meets Olga, falls in love. And like I said, there's this repetitive process of just Olga kind of in, you know, invigorating him in some way where he thinks he's gonna make something and he does get out of bed and he does kind of temporarily change his ways. Stoles does the same way. Every kind of year or two he shows up, he's like, what are you doing? Let's get it together. He gets it together and then Stoles leaves, he falls apart. And this made me think, are people capable of changing? Because I'm sure you know someone that's like that in your life, or maybe yourself in that way, you can think, you know, I keep trying to lose weight and I, I you know, can do it for a few weeks and then I fall off, you know, or, I, or I'm trying to stay on this diet or I'm trying to um, start some new habit, right? And you, you do it for two weeks, three weeks, and then you revert back to your same ways. You just can't stick with it. And it makes me think on a small scale and big scale, can people truly change? And how is that achieved? Now, I think traditionally we, we kind of say, okay, well, you need a support group. You need a friend to kind of, you know, watch you. This is very common in AA. You have a sponsor, right? That kind of, you know, someone you can call and fall back on. And uh, you have your support groups. For some people, it's reading a self-help motivational book that inspires them and gets them out the front door, right? But I do feel like, and this is something pointed out by Stoles later, is I think that if you tie your dependency too strong, in the long term at least, to some kind of external source, you're bound to fail. You're bound to revert back. Now, how do you, again, how do you incite and stimulate this kind of internal fire? How do you actually change permanently? And I think it has to be internal. Like you have to find that, that why, that aim, that passion internally that will carry you indefinitely, you know, that will actually change your character if it's going to be changed at all. It has to become internal. Maybe it starts with a support group or, or a sponsor or some kind of help, but it has to be maintained, I think, internally. Because otherwise, that once that hand held, that holding, that person holding your hand, once they let go, it, it all becomes ephemeral. It all fades away. It's just how I see it. Um, but, but this is something that some people, again, they like to lie to themselves, and perhaps it's not a lie. Again, we're exploring this topic, but they lie to themselves and say, I just, I can't do what you do, right? They, they look at it and say, well, even if, even because it's easier for you or for whatever reason, you can stick to this habit, but I can't. You can stick to this diet, but I can't. And people like to shift it on genetics, or they shift it on, um, again, you had an easier path than me, so it's impossible for me, even if it's if it's just a matter of it being more difficult. But we see this with the Blomov. He's talking to Stoles, they're arguing, he says, you're different, Andre. You have wings. You don't live, you fly. You have gifts, ambition. You're not fat. You don't suffer from styes. You're not continually overcome by doubts. You are somehow made differently. You know, you're, you're built different, as, the, as people say nowadays. You have something different in you, right? Some different nature that you're, you're born with, some different gift that allows you to fly, right? That allows you to not have these doubts. And a blow mall believes himself to be utterly incapable of change. He's inert in this. He's, he's just stuck. And Andre immediately says, that's nonsense. Man was created to arrange life for himself, even to change his own nature. But you grow a belly and think that nature has sent you this burden. You had wings, but you got rid of them. So again, he's, he's not saying it's going to be easy, but he's saying that, you know, you put that belly on, you put some of these burdens in your way, you had opportunities, you still have opportunities to change, yet you cut away those wings. You could have flown too, you cut away those wings. And I think that's something we see in society today. We see some of these people, whether it's addiction or whether, which, which can be, again be drawn in a more chemical way. So let's maybe think of something else, but you know, people drawn in to certain patterns of life, certain ways of living, and they, they wanna change their life, they wanna change their situation, they wanna get out of their job or whatever, and they feel stuck and they look at their peers and they might say, you have it easier or, you know, they have something that I don't have. And uh, again, there's, there's certainly 
variability from one human to the next. But it is this obstinate way of thinking, this stubborn way of thinking to just think that it is impossible, that they have some kind of trick up their sleeve that you don't have access to that allows them to do this when really it is, it is, it is hard, it is difficult, and you have to, again, pull yourself out of there. Yet, yet, the interesting part about this that I came to think about as I finished the novel is is my way of living or some other way of living the right way of living and we'll get to the ideal life and happiness following this but you know is the way that Stoll's professing things is that the right way to live is a blow them all actually living the best life for him are we all born to be leaders are we all born to do great things are we all born Napoleons and it's just a matter of nurture that changes our outcomes that's worth pondering. And we see this on uh, page 536 in this edition where Blomoff, again, to end the story, falls into the same patterns. In this instance, he at least is in a, in a he's in his idyllic state. He's in his ideal situation where he is in this, uh, again, pure relaxation, idleness, <laughs> doing whatever he wants, laying around basically. But he's around people he loves. He's at least in a better situation than he is earlier in the novel. And we find him here with this quote right here, quote, never having experienced the delights of winning anything by striving, Oblomov dismissed the idea and felt at peace with himself only in his forgotten corner of the world, a stranger to action, struggle, and life. So this is a man, again, that he's a spectator. He's never stepped foot in the arena. He's always been on the outskirts, always the man watching the man in the arena, never the man himself. He's a stranger to action, a stranger to struggle, a stranger to really pursuing life, engaging with it. Yet, he's at peace with himself. You know, he's happy. He, he, he dies, you know, alone, but he dies at peace here in the story. And it, it really makes you question, you know, is, is that wrong? I mean, it's, it's, it's wrong to me. I think life is supposed to be lived. It's, it's supposed to be in pursuit of, of, of passions and curiosity. It's supposed to be explored, right? But for someone else, if that, if that brings them misery, is that wrong? You know, is, is, the, is the meaning of life ubiquitous? Yeah, I, I just think it's, it's worth exploring because later we see on the next page, uh, he had not been born and raised as a gladiator for the arena, but as a placid spectator of the battle. His timid, indolent soul could have endured neither shocks nor the anxieties of happiness, and as a consequence, he expressed only one aspect of life, and there was no use repenting, struggling, or trying to change anything. So it's almost like by telling him all the things he should be doing, by trying to push him to be someone he's not, you're making him miserable. Rather, if you just let him be what he wants to be, even if that would be miserable to you, he's living his best life. So I don't, I don't know. I, I think... That concept alone was really interesting and developed throughout the entire novel was this idea of fate and someone's nature and trying to change their nature. And does that make them happy or does it, is it, is it right? Uh, and I, I think it's worth reflecting on more and more. Next, let's talk about the ideal life. You know, what is, what is the ideal life? What is the right way to live it? And again, we, we have this introduced very early. It's the, it's the argument that gets a blow off out of bed. And I, I kind of discussed it earlier. He's looking at people around him. He's like, they're living in a meaningless life. I'm just in bed. But, you know, why is my, my meaningless life any more meaningless or a wrong way of living? And um, he, he points this out here. He's yelling at Stoll. says, quote, are these people not dead? Are they not sleeping their lives away? Why am I more guilty than they lying at home in my own bed instead of vitiating my brain with aces and knaves? Again, like what's, you know, what's so wrong about my way? They're, they're chasing all these thrills and wasting their times. You know, we think today, okay, they're going out clubbing, going to happy hour, you know, being friends with these coworkers that they trash when they're not in front of them and they talk behind their backs. And, you know, none of this is actually for any purpose. It's all empty. It's all, it's all vain. It's all banal, right? And he's, he's right in a lot of ways, you know, isn't he? Isn't he right that a lot of this is pointless and meaningless, that people are living these very vain and empty and unfulfilling lives? Yet, his way is not of living is not right either. But Oblomov's way of living is kind of a reaction to what he's seen. 
He again is the superfluous man where he has these ideals for a different way of living and he doesn't fit in in society, but, but that doesn't necessarily make his way right or worthy of our admiration. And uh, Stoll's views life as very much work. He's not quite the hustle culture guy, you know, but he does look at life. He says life is about work. It's about exerting yourself. It's about um, laboring towards something. You know, it's about striving. You know, he's, he's very Nietzschean in that way. Not quite will to power, but definitely will towards towards a power, towards a striving. It's this idea, more Schopenhauerian, I would say, than Nietzschean, where uh, life is not about kind of reaching some some pinnacle or some idle peak state, right? It is about a continuous striving. It's this hungry, insatiable will that is that is thrusting you forward. Um, and, and, and continuing to kind of strive is, is supposed to be where you find your happiness. It's in the work. Um, so he says, you know, quote, you know, because Oblomov keeps saying, like, when are you going to live? When are these people actually going to live their lives? They're so worried about working. When are they going to live? And I, I, God, I hear this from people all the time because I'm uh, at times a bit of a workaholic myself. And people are like, when are you going to live? You know, live. And it is living, sitting on a beach. Is it is it working towards retirement where I can just sit on a beach all day or sit in a recliner and watch a pawn stars over and over again? Like, I think people kind of get it twisted. Like for me, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy making these videos. I enjoy pouring myself into some of these hobbies or skills or these passions. Like I, I enjoy every day and, and I'm so grateful that I do. But that still includes a lot of work, and the work is is fulfilling because it does provide this life. It provides for my family, and that's kind of what Stoll's is getting at. He's not really the hustle culture guy. He's not just like work all day and just like you know die with your face into a keyboard. He's just saying that the work is meaningful. Um, he says, "quote For the sake of work, nothing more. Work is the form and content, the purpose, the very essence of life. At least of my life. You have banished work from your life, and what is left." You know, like you're just laying around. You have, you're not accomplishing anything. You're not doing anything. You're simply existing. Not only are you not striving, you're not really living either. You're simply existing. And there's a lot of danger in simply existing. And we see this written very beautifully on page 267. He says, quote, when you don't know what you're living for, you simply live from one day to the next, happy when the day is over and night has come. And you can bury in sleep the tiresome question why you have lived this day and why you will live the next. You know, if you just spend all day in bed, you're just diverting yourself from facing reality and facing your purposeless, meaningless life. So what is the ideal life? I think what, what Goncharov believes it to be and kind of what I believe it to be is this pursuit. It's a pursuit, and what is it a pursuit of? It's, it's satisfying curiosity. It's chasing these, these aims and these passions, the things that make life worth living, the, the moments where you're so thrilled and enthralled with what you're doing that the grass seems to speak to you. The, the sky seems more vibrant today than it did the last or the moments prior. Life just seems, again, vivacious and worth living when you're excited and passionate. It's the feeling of being in love. It's the, it's the feeling of finding a new hobby and just finding yourself, uh, you know, just wanting to drown yourself in the new thing that you're doing. It's drowning yourself in, a, in an incredible book. It's that kind of feeling. That's what makes life worth living. It's satisfying these, this, this hunger for learning and curiosity and exploring life. Life's meant to be lived very vaguely and simply, to put it that way. Um, yet at the same time, I, I read this novel, and as I mentioned in the, the previous theme, is Oblomov's way wrong? You know, is he is he wrong to live that way? Is the nine to five worker in Iowa or, or you know, working 80 hour weeks, blue collar job, is he doing something wrong where he's not satisfying some kind of curiosity, but he's he's happy to provide for his family, he's grateful for his job. Like is he living the wrong way? I think about that. Like is someone is someone else living the wrong way for them? And this is one of my favorite quotes in the whole book. I think it doesn't solely pertain to the entire character within the moment, but I, I, th I just think it's a beautiful quote. So on page 203, quote, another man is miserable because he's condemned to sit in an office every day till five o'clock while someone else sighs because he is denied such a blessing. You know, what it, the job that you hate right now would be an absolute blessing to someone else. You know, it, 
it, it's it's simply the, the idea of love yours yeah, like love love your lawn love your wife don't don't chase after the girl next door don't don't wish you had the house down the street with the big pool and the yeah be grateful for what you have um, and and to each his own in a lot of ways you know like what's what's grateful what's great for one person's life what's the ideal life for one person I don't believe is ubiquitous for everybody yet at the same time I do still find myself believing that the ideal life is one that is lived it is lived curiously it is lived intentionally it is lived inquisitively passionately but it did get my brain churning you know like what is it ubiquitous? Is is this something I can, is this ideal life something I can cast upon other people? And is that right to do? Lastly, I want to talk about the theme of love and somewhat marriage as well. Because we see this throughout the story with part, part two and part three almost cover Olga and Oblomov's entire relationship, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and, and we also see into the part four, Olga marrying Stoles as well. Um, don't you love it when your your childhood or best friend marries the girl that you loved? <laughs> but that's besides the point. Oblomo is actually happy about it, and, and for good reason. It's kind of sweet. But uh, particularly, I want to talk about like what is the nature of love, and also loving the idea of somebody rather than what they actually are. Because Olga plays this savior role. She is the archetypical naive young girl that goes. I can change him. I can change him. I can make him different. He'll change for me. Sorry, sweetheart. He is he is not changing for you. He is he is the the same man you see today. He's going to fall back in his old ways. And uh we see that <laughs> we see that today with uh, a lot of probably ex-partners and um and we see that with a blow-off as well where as much as Olga tries and she she tries. She gives him plenty of chances. Uh, and, and he tries, he, he tries himself, you know, he tries to, again, get, get out of this funk, you know, try and make something of himself, but he completely continues to recede back, back. And, um, uh, it's frustrating, but the reason Olga has this love for him is it's a bit love from pity. And it's also a lot of loving the man she thinks he can be. He has this pure soul. He's he's a very sweethearted guy. You know, he's very honest. And this is what Stoles praises him for at the end is his purity and his fidelity and his loyalty and honesty. Yet he's he's just he's indecisive, he's obstinate, he's indolent, he's stuck in his ways. And um Olga at at, at one point just kind of gives up on him. And um well before I get to that, I, I want to say too, like Love is love is a risk, and this is what what prevents Oblomov from really getting to that other side from marrying Olga, is that love is a risk. Love is always a risk, and it's a risk of heartbreak. It's a it's a risk of failure. It's a risk of falling into what Oblomov calls the eternal abyss, of just again falling into hopelessness, and it always is. It's always a roll of the dice. To love something is to risk losing something. And, and the Stoics kind of talk about this too. Like if you assign love or meaning to something and then you lose it, like you're losing a part of yourself. But, uh, you know, if anyone's lost a spouse, a family member, a dog, even a pet, it it hurts. But you don't regret loving the thing. You know, you have to love. Like life is life is loving and emotions. And love is a, is a central part, I believe, of life. Um, so that's, that's really what prevents a off from taking that leap and that almost giving him that paralysis by analysis is just his fear of him or Olga falling into this abyss of them falling out of love with each other. But eventually to get back to it, she, she gives up on him and, uh, says, quote, I thought I could bring you back to life that you could live again for me, but you have died long ago. And a couple pages later, she, she realizes that the mistake she's made is she loved the Oblomov that she, that she thought of. You know, she, she loved the Oblomov that she thought he could be, not the Oblomov he was. And so that was that was the mistake. And uh, their, their love overall was just a little bit of a facade. It was, it was a little bit of some naive, like a flash in the pan love too. Because Stoltz points out in a quote that something along the lines of, you know, you, you placed your love and meaning in life in some idealistic version of each other. Uh, and, and that's not... That's not what love is. That's not what what happiness really is. The quote describes it a bit better than I just did there. So I'm going to mention it here. Quote, note please that life itself and work constitute the aim of life, not woman. 
That was the mistake you both made. So again, they both made the mistake of putting their happiness and their love too too much into this this dream, this this abstraction that they wanted to believe was real, that they hoped would eventually be real, but was not. Now, what is real happiness? What is what is long lasting love look like? Is it paradise all day? <laughs> I think any of you that are married or or in a relationship know that there's honeymoon months, right? Where you first meet somebody and everything is perfect. Every day is amazing. You you can't wait to see them. You know, you go home, you want to you know, text or call them immediately, see them the next day. And eventually that fades. And it doesn't fade because the love isn't real. It doesn't mean that you don't love them. It's just that irrational and erratic love and passion that holds on to you is not sustainable. It's it's jet fuel, you know? It's it, it gets you off the ground, but eventually you, you need to find a little bit more of a sustainable source of fuel. And, uh, and, and, and that's there, you know, that's there in marriage and it, and it does take continuous work and that's, that's what it is. And it's continuously learning the person and loving the person and, and growing together and adapting. But we see Olga at some point with years into marriage with Stoles wonders like, what's, what's wrong with me? Is there something wrong with me? I have all these reasons for happiness. Yet I am, I'm discontent. I have this knot of melancholic discontent and unease within me. What is wrong? You know, why am I depressed? And she talks to her husband and he reflects upon it. And he's like, this is totally normal. Like it, it's totally normal. And it's actually helpful because life isn't a continuous slip and slide. Life isn't a continuous, uh, roller or it's not a continuous uh you know drip of happiness basically there are moments of doubts and of questions and minds that the individuals who have minds that are that are very curious that are constantly thinking and that are, are are contemplating and ruminating and thinking deeply on things they 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 will have this need for curiosity, this need to continue to kind of explore it and, and again, try and satiate that hunger. And uh, he, he pinpoints it well in this quote on 523. Uh, ah, that's what one has to pay for the Promethean fire. It is not enough merely to endure. You have to love your melancholy, to respect your doubts and questions. There are the surplus, the luxury of life, which appears for the most part on the summits of happiness when there are no base desires. There is no room for them in the lives of ordinary people, nor among those in sorrow or in need. Most people go through life knowing nothing of that mist of doubt, those anguishing questions. But for those who have encountered them at the right time, they come not as a millstone, but as welcome guests. So once you've reached a state of, of bliss, of happiness, of content, and you don't have sorrow and grief and these needs that, or, or persistent labor that maybe the average man has to kind of toil through, once you've reached this state of pure bliss, you you have moments of melancholy because you, you're kind of like uh, a fall into the state of complacency. And that's, you know, the, the Promethean fire he's speaking about there, the, the desire for knowledge, the desire for, in that story, to, to, to have fire is what, again, makes life worth living. You need to continuously feed your body this this excitement these passions you can't just grow idle you need to continuously strive continuously look for those um those anguishing questions and satisfy those cravings basically and, and she realizes that uh as she's talking through here is that happiness is not a it's not a destination it's 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 an action you know it is it is a moving wheel it's not a, a place to sit and rest basically is kind of what's going on there. And I think that's quite accurate to the ideal life, to the happiness, to love. It's it's not like you you reach this pinnacle and you sit there. It, it is to, it takes continuous work. And if you do have that kind of pensive mind that is always wandering and it's it's not going to be happy at a at a standstill. You need to keep feeding it. So all in all, I found this work to be incredibly enlightening, a lighthearted read, very enjoyable. And I think you will too. So I'd recommend picking up a copy of Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov. And if you want my written review, not only of this book, but of other reviews of books and a lot more that, I am, that I've spent time writing, check out my Substack. Uh, I'm, I'm posting all my book reviews on there. I have a number already posted. And also I am posting every you know one to two posts per week 
all my sub stacks. I'm back active there, thankfully. I'm so grateful for all the support I've had from many of you already on Substack. Uh, but check that out. And also follow me on Instagram. I have a new Instagram account specifically for literature, for book discussions and recommendations and all of that that I'm going to be quite active on. So follow that as well. All that will be linked in the description. But yeah, let me know what you guys thought. So have you read this book before? Um, is there another Russian masterpiece that's lesser known that I should keep an eye out for? Comment below, like the video, subscribe if you want more content like this. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.